Welcome to the Ernie Chambers Show. Well, I'm back again. So I will open as usual, brothers and sisters, friends, enemies, and neutrals. The reason I give that opening, I have no way of knowing who will be watching this program. Some people will agree, others will disagree, but why should that surprise any of us? We don't all have the same experiences. We don't have the same background. We don't have the same desires or interests. So it's impossible for us to agree on everything. And if we did, as has been said, it would be the dullest place in the world. Now, I'm not a psychologist, not a psychiatrist, only because I don't have the academic training. But in a way, every one of us is a psychologist, maybe not a psychiatrist because we don't know how to interpret and explain everything that happens. And neither do psychiatrists have that ability, but at least they have the kind of training which will give them an indication of symptoms and when they detect certain signs or symptoms in a person, their training comes into play and they know how to deal with that individual. If he or she is too high and up here, then they know how to bring them down gently. If they're way down here, they know how to buoy them up and lift them, not so rapidly that they lose their breath. But nobody should underestimate his or her native intellectual ability. We are not what we learn in school. We are born full-fledged human beings. There's a certain dignity that everybody, anything born of a man and a woman, which produces a human being, has a certain human dignity, which should not be demeaned or degraded by anybody. Mine goes so far as to embrace convicted murderers, meaning that to execute, to deliberately, in a ceremonial, ritualistic way, kill another human being, to me, is not only a deprivation of that individual's human dignity, but our own. Not everybody would agree with me, obviously, because there are some people who are rabid about having the death penalty. There are others, such as judges, who pronounce a death penalty. There are others called executioners who do the actual dirty work of the society. And through it all, everybody has his or her human dignity diminished to some extent. I say again, not everybody sees it the way I see it, but I have enough feeling of respect for my own intellectual ability, my sense of personal responsibility to say and do what it is that I believe. You cannot live for me. You cannot suffer for me. I have to chart my own path and follow it. If one person says I'm a fool, that may be his or her honest opinion. If 10,000 people say it, that may be their honest opinion, but that does not make it so. Consider the huge numbers of people who thought the earth was flat, like a disc, which turns out not to be true. Some people think still that the earth is the center of the solar system because they live on the planet earth and human beings are more important than anything else that is in the universe or could be conceived of as being in the universe. This belief was held so firmly that when a man said the earth is not the center of the universe. The then most powerful single religion among white folks, the Catholic Church, 
felt that his saying that was so much against what the church wanted people to believe that they were going to make him say something different. It didn't matter whether he believed what he said or not. The thing that was necessary was to make him say the words that they wanted to come out of him. So at first they threatened him. Now, naturally, I wasn't there. I don't even know if Galileo existed. Nothing that I read about in history do I of my own personal knowledge know. Regardless of how long one of us lives, even if the years that are recorded in the Bible were periods of time of 365 days or 500 days, it doesn't matter. Whatever number of years a human being will be on this earth is as a pop of the finger when you consider eternity. Time is like the dripping of water from the faucet of eternity. Galileo said that from his studies of the divine constellations in the heavens and the movement that he detected, the earth is not the center of the solar system. The sun does not orbit the earth. The earth goes around the sun. That was too much for the church. So they put him on the rack. And that is a hellish device that is so cruel, dehumanizing, and vicious that only religious people could create it. The types of tortures inflicted by the Catholic Church were so brutal and dehumanizing that they characterized the Catholic Church. The term inquisition now has become synonymous with torture, not a system where you make inquiry, you seek information, but a system which inflicts as much human pain and suffering as a diabolical mind reinforced with the nonsense of Christianity can invent. Devils did not torture people in the way the Catholic Church did. Can you imagine being burned alive? Have a hot plate, some of you don't know what that is, but anyway, from the descriptive term, imagine what it is. A metal disc that's circular, you plug a cord into the wall socket, electricity flows through that cord, it's converted into energy which heats that metal plate and you set a pot on it and you can cook. Well, suppose instead of setting a pot on it, somebody puts, when it's as hot as it can go, puts your hand on it and sets a pot on your hand and makes you stay there and you can't move your hand. Catholic Church, they burned women, burned men. And you know how they justified it? They went to the Old Testament and there's a verse in the Bible which said, you shall not suffer a witch to live. So they converted that into a statement that said, you shall make a witch suffer until she dies. And you know what constituted a witch? Not whatever, but whomever the church decided to declare a witch or a heretic. One who at one time was deceived by the church and went along then became enlightened and could no longer hold to those things that he or she did not believe. And because that person's honest convictions carried them down a path the church didn't like, the church would inflict these cruel punishments. Burning alive was the most ingenious thing that they could come up with. It became known as an auto de fe, 
auto da fe, an act of faith, but it was hideous. Imagine piles of wood, a person tied to a post and the fire lit around that person's feet. The crackling of the flames, the smoke, then suddenly there's the stench of burning flesh. That's what happened when these white Christians in the South would burn black people alive. There's a close correlation between religion and cruelty. But at any rate, Galileo, because of what his mind told him, was forced when he spoke to speak what he deemed to be the truth. So they put him on the rack and they began to turn a crank and it began to stretch him. The tendons and ligaments stretched. Then his bones had reached the outer limit and a few more cranks and they would separate. And they said, Galileo, and Galileo said, because they wanted him to, that the earth is the center of the solar system and the sun moves around the earth. In other words, he did what they call recanting. He took it all back. So then they began to loosen and relax the tension on him, the bones, readjusted, took their regular position, the tendons and ligaments shortened as they were supposed to. Galileo began to relax. He was still in pain, but then his mind reasserted itself. The truth as he knew it within himself overwhelmed him. And although he had been saying, the earth does not move, no, the earth is stationary and the sun moves around the earth. But as he began to come to, back to himself, his sanity overcame his pain and they were about to loosen him. He said about the earth, but it does move. A man of truth, speaking the truth. And that's what happened to him. Could such a thing happen today? It may be happening somewhere right now. The point of all of that is to indicate that differences of opinion cannot be avoided. Two of us can read the identical words in a book and come away with a different understanding because different words mean different things to different people. Some people will skim over some words and they see them but the words carry no particular meaning. But another person, because of his or her education, experiences, upbringing, will linger over every word. Then when they're all put together in sentences that form paragraphs, will produce a meaning unique to that individual because the individual is unique. Somebody having a different opinion from mine will not anger me. What anger rests in the bosom of a fool, said the Bible. It doesn't say that anger is a sin because the Bible says, be angry and sin not. Well, if being angry in and itself, in of itself is a sin, then whenever you're angry, you're committing a sin. So how, if anger itself is a sin, could the Bible say, be angry and sin not? doesn't make sense, does it? Because it's nonsensical. Anger is a natural human emotion. And there are times when there is such a thing as righteous anger. But the Bible enshrined, because men wrote the Bible, maybe some women, and then a man liked it and put his name on it. The one who wrote the five books, the ones they attribute to Moses, Maybe some woman named Mozella wrote those books. 
and he stole them and put Moses. Anyway, anger rests in the bosom of a fool. Then how can you be angry and sin not? Don't let the anger rest there. If anger is a motivating force that leads you to take action to correct something that your conscience tells you ought to be modified, not by any means, but only such means are minimally necessary. Being as careful as you can not to hurt or harm somebody else in the process. Let the anger be the driving force, but when it rests in you, then it saps your strength, your brain reacts to it, it begins to secrete chemicals that are necessary to preserve the organism, which mean gets you ready for flight or fight. If you can't whip it, outrun it. If you can't outrun it, be ready to stand and fight. There were two guys, and you, some of you heard this, they were walking around mountain trails and up ahead they saw this huge bear rise up on his back legs and they got ready to start running and one guy had on tennis shoes and he bent over and started tying his tennis shoes and his friend said man you better come on and run he just kept tying his tennis shoes and his friend said that your tennis shoes being tied will not help you outrun the bear. He said, I don't have to outrun the bear. I just have to outrun you. Then it's up to you and the bear. Then you say like that preacher, Lord, if you can't help me, please, whatever you do, don't help that bear. Now, where am I going with this? Back to where I was starting. Differences of opinion can be valuable. Scientists, don't all see eye to eye on an issue. There can be two who study bacteria using the same specimens, the same microscope, either light or electron, and come away with different conclusions as to what it is ultimately they're looking at. If they were asked to draw it and they could properly render with a pencil what they saw, they might draw exactly the same thing, but that's as far as their agreement goes. One says, I watched that tail on it, that flagellum, and because of the way it moved, I determined that such and such is the case. And the other one says, well, I saw the same thing, but I arrived at the opposite conclusion. So then they come and do what the Bible say, come let us reason together, not go to war. Two good minds can bring something out of nothing, which is better when it's produced than either one operating individually can do. So the Bible said, let's not go to war. Come, let us reason together. And it would be good if people could do that. And they could if they would let the better angels of their nature or the angels of their better nature rule their conduct. There's too much concern with what other people think or what other people are going to say. What difference does it make what anybody says unless you're in a courtroom and the somebody is a judge about to pronounce some kind of a sentence? But then it makes a difference only because there is the power of the state to compel you to do certain things from that point onward. And if you won't voluntarily do it, for example, leave the courtroom when the judge tells you to, they drag you out or carry you out. There is more force than you can withstand. So the force prevails and you, the object, will be moved wherever that force decides to take you. But when it comes to your mind, if you can strengthen your will however you would define it, but that's something which gives you the strength to stand up for what you believe, wherever you are, no matter with whom it is you're dealing, you strengthen that will. And when your will says, 
hold on and you're able to hold on when there's nothing in you then you're strong so believe in yourself trust your judgment never give up never give in and don't quit most of the time if you quit it's not because somebody has a pistol up to your head it's just that your will weakens you drop your guard and you feel like you can't go on but you can go on you must go on and you will go on this is not what i intended to talk about but i felt a need and i'm not superstitious maybe i am in my own way but not the kind of superstition where i believe in ghosties goblins long-leggedy beasties and things that go bump in the night but at any rate sometimes i will get you all call it a feeling that certain things ought to be said by me at a given time i'm talking now about the feeling that i might have if somebody, back to what I was saying, calls me a fool, does that make me a fool? Often it makes the one who says it a fool. I won't argue with white people about issues relative to race. They don't know enough. They don't have a factual background. They know nothing about history. They've been taught to expunge from their memory all of the negative criminal things that white people have done to black people down through the years. So my arguing with a person like that would be like two drunks under a street light, slurring and arguing back and forth at each other. I won't do that. They can think whatever they want to and their thinking it does not make it so. But I'm gonna take a slight turn here your thinking when it comes to yourself can make something so. I listen to all kinds of music, hillbilly music, bluegrass music, cowboy music, country slash Western music, jazz, blues, whatever label it's given. It's as somebody said, music is a concord of sweet sounds. Some will appeal to you, some won't. Some can alter your mood. Some can put you into a certain mood. But at any rate, there are people who will express feelings in the lyrics of a song that they could not express conversationally. So those people write music. There's a guy named William Robinson who was good at this, but Nobody had recognized it at first. He began to offer things to a fellow who ran an operation that came to be known as Motown. He had submitted a hundred lyrics. None was accepted. Then he produced one and bingo, he hit the jackpot and the first one that he wrote, I'm not gonna tell you which one it is. And when I tell you what he's known as, then you can find it. He came to be known as Smokey Robinson. And he wrote a song that a lot of people are familiar with, not because Smokey sang it, but because the temptation sang it. It was just my imagination once again, running away with me. Smokey Robinson wrote that song, just my imagination. Sometimes somebody else can take what you put together and do more with it than you can. So put it out there. It'll find its niche. But at any rate, there's a song and it has its roots in psychological, truth sometimes you can lie to yourself that's what it's called 
and say, I am this, I am that. I'm going to ignore all of these faults and pretend I don't have them. People say, no, you must face all these things. Maybe under some circumstances, true. But this song that I'm thinking about could be considered kind of childish, but its roots are in the truth of psychology. Whenever I feel erect, afraid, I hold my head erect and whistle a happy tune and no one will suspect I'm afraid. That's when you're other people conscious. No one will suspect I'm afraid because I'm whistling this soon, tune. While shivering in my shoes, I strike a careless pose and whistle a happy tune and no one ever knows I'm afraid. It's called whistling past the cemetery. You believe in ghosts and goblins and long legged beasties and things that go bump in the night. So when you pass the cemetery, you whistle to try to bore yourself up. But there may be more truth than poetry in that. The result of this deception is very strange to tell. For when I fool the people I fear, I fool myself as well. I fool myself as well. I convince myself that there's no need for me to be afraid. And if I configure my posture, that even helps my mood. And I become what I'm pretending to be. And maybe I'm not pretending. Maybe the pretending or the unreality is when I'm being afraid. And what I really am is fearless. Take it for what it's worth. But now I'm going to touch on some of the things that I really came to talk about. It deals with the police. I'm going to start with this article that appeared in the Lincoln Journal Star, November 15th, 2014. Former LPD Lincoln Police Department officers hired by Sheriff, comma, State Patrol. Complaints of excessive force had been filed against the two policemen. John McGahan, the Lincoln Police Department's 2013 Officer of the Year, who resigned this year after internal affairs accused him of using excessive force, is now working at the Lancaster County Sheriff's Office. A second police officer accused of using excessive force, Jeremy Wilhelm, is a trooper candidate with the Nebraska State Patrol. McGahan, 47, was hired by the sheriff's office in early August, two and a half months after he left a 24 year career at LPD. He submitted his resignation to LPD in mid February after internal affairs investigators watched a Lancaster County jail video that showed McGahan above an inmate early on December 13. The 54-year-old transient was handcuffed and fell forward and hit his head on the wall of a jail cell after he was shoved, leaving blood. McGahan said in an affidavit to jail, the man, he was giving an affidavit that the man fell. He did not mention in the affidavit that he pushed the man who required treatment at a hospital. Jail staff watched the video and reported to police that McGahan used too much force, which led police chief Jim Pashong to order the internal affairs investigation. McGahan told investigators he pushed the inmate because he was afraid he'd turn and continue fighting, but internal affairs sustained the complaint against him. He lied. The video showed he lied. Sheriff Terry Wagner said he watched the video, 
talked to former colleagues of McGay hands and has no qualms about hiring him. But Samuel Walker, Professor Emeritus with the University of Nebraska School of Criminology and Criminal Justice said there's no excuse to hire someone with the excessive force complaint in his background. Quote, you wouldn't and shouldn't take a chance with someone who's got that kind of a record, he said. It's asking for trouble. Smaller police or sheriff's departments sometimes hire such officers because the departments don't do thorough background checks, said the professor. That's different from hiring someone knowing that officers from two other agencies, in McGahan's case, the jail and LPD, accused the applicant of using too much force, Walker said. McGahan declined to comment about being hired by the sheriff's office or what happened at the jail. Wagner said sheriff's office policy forbids deputies from talking to the media without permission. Wagner agreed that McGahan shouldn't have pushed the man in the jail cell, but disagreed that the slip up made him a bad man. Quote, John used poor judgment and made a mistake, Wagner said Friday, adding that he dug into McGahan's record and found only the one complaint. Quote, just because they have one incident of misconduct, it doesn't mean they're a bad person or that they're a bad officer. We all make mistakes, like taking a handcuffed person, pushing him against the wall and leaving blood and he has to be hospitalized. For a cop, that's a mere mistake. Suppose I, a citizen, push somebody against the wall, drew blood. Are they gonna say, well, that was just a mistake, let it go. You know where I would be and what they would try to do with me. But continuing, was he having a bad day? Probably. Does he regret it? Absolutely. He regrets it because he got caught this time. Wagner said he and his deputies investigated the jail incident and watched the video. The sheriff said he might have disciplined one of his deputies if they had pushed an inmate like that, but he probably would not fire them. And that's why these cops do these things. The sheriff said he also interviewed McGahan's supervisors and fellow officers from LPD who spoke highly of him. But what about the internal affairs investigation that concluded he used excessive force. And after that investigation, he suddenly decided that he should resign. But continuing, the sheriff, I never personally worked with John, Wagner said, but I had a lot of unsolicited visits from administrators and command officers who said, you know what? If you don't take him, you're really missing out on a really good quality guy who just made a mistake, unquote. Yeah, something like when Castellano was shot dead on the orders of John Gotti when he was leaving a restaurant in New York. Just one of those things, but he's really underneath it all, he's a good guy. Oh, and Gotti, he dresses well. He was known as the Dapper Don, he dressed so well. So just because he had a guy erased, all oh, that shows since he was eating in this steakhouse that eating too much red meat can be bad for your health. So really John Gotti was giving advice that would help everybody else live longer. Mm -hmm. Everybody feels that way except Castellano and his family. Anyway, Wagner said McGahan took the number one spot out of 200 applicants on an examination and so forth. And that's why I hired him. State law requires Wagner to hire one of the commission's top three candidates for any given opening. In this case, he said he chose the top four people for the spots he had to fill. McGahan took a 13% pay cut by moving to the sheriff's office, said Doug McDaniel, personnel director for both the city and the county. If he hadn't done something wrong and was not about to be fired, do you think he would have voluntarily taken a pay cut? Continuing, it tells that McGahan's final average salary at LPD was $68,228. 
and he was on track to earn a pension worth $43,000. Going to work for the sheriff, it would drop to $37,000. And he just did that. In the other case, involving a police officer and the use of excessive force, former LPD officer Will, Wilhelm is now a Nebraska State Patrol trooper. Trooper candidate, set to graduate in May, said patrol spokeswoman Deb Collins. The March video captured the 13-year LPD veteran as he shoved a homeless man into a wall and then across a room at the People City Mission. Internal Affairs investigations with the police department sustained an excessive force complaint against Wilhelm and in May, the Lincoln Police Union said it would help Wilhelm fight the accusation. You know that solid wall of blue? One bad hand washes the other dirty hand. Wilhelm went to his disciplinary hearing, Pashong said Friday. Pashong declined to say what happened at the hearing, but said Wilhelm quit the department about a month ago to join the patrol. So he was on the way out the door. Collins, the spokesperson for the state patrol, said all recruits go through an extensive interview process before starting the 23 weeks of training. She could not comment Friday on whether patrol officials knew about the LPD finding of excessive force against Wilhelm. They had to know. There was no way not to know. They got his records. These police, these cops and others talk to each other. Police Union President Chris Millicitz couldn't be reached for comment on when and why Wilhelm Helm left LPD. Somebody, though, is always there to throw a dead cat on the line. And in Nebraska, when cops do wrong and other officials do wrong and nobody else will speak up, the dead cat comes alive. And instead of going, it's more like, ah, ah, and bears fangs. You, you get the picture? Sometimes one snarl is worth more than a thousand words. That, that article was dated November 15, 2014. Well, when all these developments develop, you know, came to light, this article I'm reading is from January 2015, which was a couple of weeks a uh, month later, Chambers calls for ex action on excessive force. And this is not unusual. 25 page letter seeks charges against rogue police. Senator Ernie Chambers condemned prosecutors Friday for not charging two Lincoln police officers who resigned under weight of excessive force accusations and warned that not doing so emboldened these rogue police to engage in more brutality. Chambers of Omaha wrote Lancaster County Attorney Joe Kelly, a 25 page treatise on law enforcement. In the wake of a Journal Star investigation into excessive force complaints sustained by the Lincoln Police Department against officers John McGahan and Jeremy Wilhelm. Both officers resigned from LPD but found jobs with other law enforcement agencies. Chambers accuses Kelly of giving a pass to McGahan and Wilhelm, one he would not give to someone who wasn't a cop. Quote, your office, well, I'm not going to read everything here because I'm going to read some from this letter. But anyway, well, I will read a bit from it because my time is running. As the Bible says, and it was written by a guy who'd gotten old, my days are faster than a weaver's shuttle. We're having so much fun here today that time flew by and my time is almost up. This letter was dated January 10th, 2015. It's addressed to Joe Kelly, Lancaster County attorney, who when Trump took over because Kelly is a Republican, got appointed to be the US attorney and his headquarters were in Omaha. 
regarding state sanctioned police violence, lawless cops slash and a reluctant prosecutor. Dear Mr. Prosecutor, I'm making a record uttering condemnation and issuing a warning, a record of blatant police brutality, condemnation of non-prosecution of videotaped police criminal violence, a warning that rogue police will be emboldened to engage in more brutality, which may grow increasingly severe. Introduction. Whereas the notion, quote, giving a pass to law enforcement officers who violate the law, too often appears to be standard operation procedure within law enforcement establishment, it is foreign and indeed repugnant to the concept of the rule of law in a democratic society which lionizes and cherishes the principle that no one is above the law. Even more abhorrent and destructive of the ends of demo democratic government is the studied application of a double standard of law enforcement, one for law enforcement officers and a different one for everybody else. For instance, when a law enforcement officer is implicated in violation of criminal law, the law enforcement establishment, if not as blind as a bat, dons blinders and looks the other way. But when a private citizen falls under suspicion that establishment with a tight moral squint employs a critical unblinking microscopic eye that sees all and even sees things that are not there. On the street, this is dubbed different strokes for different folks. When the public observes this common widespread practice, the result is an undermining of trust and confidence and the loudly touted American mantra of equal justice before the law. Inevitably, the ugly practice breeds a cynical skepticism toward whatever may be said by cops and prosecutors who from time immemorial have washed each other's hands to the detriment of impartial justice that holds all accountable to the same standard. I'm calling to your attention the blatant application of the double standard of law enforcement in your bailiwick. Whereas your office acts with alacrity in filing charges against ordinary citizens suspected of law violations from traffic to practicing law without a license. Yet when lawless rogue cops are caught on camera violating the law by physically assaulting citizens, you do as much as a possum, that is nothing. It's interesting to note that the camera doesn't lie, except when it records police misconduct. The facts, the entire article from which these excerpts are drawn is enclosed. And it's that article that I was reading from, which outlined what these cops had done. They had been caught on camera, inflicting violence on people who were not resisting, not fighting. They had been subjected to internal affairs investigations findings against were that excessive force had been used, then both of them resigned, and one was hired by the sheriff's department, the other by the state patrol, continuing. Brave, heroic, heroes? Are these videotaped acts of police violence examples of the bravery manifested by heroes, the heroes in blue? Do they exemplify brave heroes heroically staring down danger? The term hero is overused, misapplied, and thereby cheapened. And heroic is applicable only if that chameleon word is properly parsed. And to spell it H-E-R-O-I-C, I let each letter stand for a word. And it comes out hiding egregious records of improper conduct referring to the cops. So-called good cops are in short supply when it comes to enforcing the law against wrongdoing perpetrators in blue. The notorious blue wall of silence is in reality a damaging conspiratorial cover-up scheme to protect and shield known criminals in blue. It is not hard to understand 
why such is the case when the example is set by prosecutors who pays little if any heed to their double oath, their oath of office as a prosecutor and their oath as a lawyer. Who will police the police? In order for the state patrol and the Lancaster County Sheriff to hire such wrongdoers who so brazenly and fragrantly violated the law on camera, both law enforcement entities are compelled to rewrite the book on the role played, the function to be performed by sworn officers of the law who are entrusted with the discretionary power to take human life. Such rewriting entails alibiing, excusing, minimizing the seriousness of ratifying, condoning, and covering over blatant criminal conduct by those who wear uniforms, badges, and deadly weapons. The Lincoln Police Department took some action. The State Patrol and the Sheriff joined you, Mr. Prosecutor, in dropping the ball. People in the legislature and other places in this society will not talk to prosecutors like this. They won't stand up to the police chief. They won't stand up to the sheriff, certainly not the head of the state patrol. Somebody has got to do it. That somebody during the years that I was in office happened to be me. Not that I was heroic. It's just that I take serious the giving of my word. And when I gave my affirmation, when I became a member of the legislature to do the job to the best of my ability, that's what I meant. As we used to say on the street, I said it, I meant it, and I'm here to represent it. And I did for 46 years. When police officers can and do commit acts of brutality, including unjustified killings, and no effective redress exists within the bounds and confines of the law, other avenues, sometimes deadly, are resorted to, as in the recent New York City example, where two perceived hunters became the hunted. The hunters were law enforcement, the hunted private citizens, where perceived lawless, unpunished killers in uniform became themselves targets and prey to the deadly force unleashed by their compatriots in blue upon private citizens. Such lethal retaliatory acts, misguided as they may be, ensnaring some who may never in any manner have abused their authority by straying outside of the law and behaving like vigilantes or members of a lynch mob are not offshoots of protests against unjustified and unpunished police killings of unarmed persons, but rather offshoots of the killings themselves. Sir Isaac Newton in 1867, in his Principia Mathematica Laws of Motion Part Two proclaimed, to every action there is always opposed an equal reaction or in popular parlance, for every action, there is an opposite equal reaction. The monster unleashed by lawless cops may be their own undoing. And although I wrote this way back then, you can see more of it now with cops being laywayed, waylaid, cops being ambushed in their cruisers, cops being called to some kind of a disturbance and ambushed, where the hunters become the hunted. And as has been said, when the rabbits get shotguns, there'll be a lot fewer hunters out there. You undoubtedly recall the recent week-long manhunt in Pennsylvania for the survivalist who killed one trooper and wounded a second at their barracks. This hunter went to the lair of the killers and put law enforcement personnel from several jurisdictions on edge. You know why? because when somebody was going to do to them what they had done to others, they knew the kind of mentality that such a person had because they had it toward unarmed civilians. And when one like them got on their trail, they all became very much on edge. Will I be next? 
continuing. And I quoted from a Lincoln Journal Star article about this situation that I'm about to talk about. Vegas gunman made no secret of extreme views. Las Vegas, Jared Miller was ready to share his anti-government views with just about anyone who would listen. Views that telegraphed his desire to kill police officers and his willingness to die for what he hoped would be a revolution against the government. Miller and his wife, Amanda, shot and killed two officers who were on their Sunday lunch break at a pizza parlor. Now, these could have been two what you call good cops. Maybe they helped old ladies across the street. Maybe they helped lost children find their way home. Maybe they intervened when a brutal man was brutalizing a helpless woman. But all these two people saw were the outer markings, the uniforms, the badges, the guns. They shot and killed two officers who were on their Sunday lunch break at a pizza parlor, then told patrons that they were starting a revolution according to police. They went next to a nearby Walmart where Amanda Miller killed a shopper who confronted her husband before police arrived. After a gun battle inside the store, Amanda Miller fatally shot her husband and then herself, police said. Not only were they unafraid to kill, they were unafraid to die. And when you have these kind of people, then you're in serious trouble. That's when the Japanese kamikaze pilots would crash their planes into American ships. Here's another article. Cop killer said he was going to be famous. Jersey City, New Jersey. A gunman who killed a rookie officer responding to a report of an armed robbery at a drugstore early Sunday never tried to rob the store and instead lay in wait for the police. Telling a witness to watch the news because he was going to be famous, authorities said. Lawrence Campbell shot Officer Melvin Santiago in the head shortly after he and his partner arrived at the 24-hour Walgreens at around 4 a.m. Jersey and Jersey City Mayor Stephen Fulop said other officers returned fire at Campbell, killing him. Campbell, 27, of Jersey City was one of three suspects wanted by police for a prior homicide, Fulop said. Fulop, Fulop said Campbell was carrying a knife when he walked into Walgreens and asked for directions to the greeting card aisle. He assaulted an armed security guard at the store and snatched his gun, Fulop said. According to Fulop, Campbell approached a witness and apologized for his conduct, then said to watch the news later because he was going to be famous, then waiting for officers to arrive and shot Santiago with what, peaceful, what police believe was the guard's weapon. Today, said the mayor, was a horrible day for Jersey City, unquote. Dozens of officers stood single file at the entrance of the hospital and saluted as Santiago's flag draped body was carried into the ambulance. A handful of younger officers consoled one another as they walked away. Santiago, 23, graduated from the police academy in December. Philip was there when San Diego's, Santiago's body arrived at the hospital. As Santiago's mother identified the body, Philip said she just kept repeating the badge number and saying that it's not possible, unquote. Santiago is the first Jersey City officer killed in the line of duty since 2009. When this article was written five years later in 2014. See, police must realize that just as there are vicious people in uniform, there are vicious people who don't wear uniforms, but the mentality is the same. These police who have stopped women, who have sexually assaulted women, 
who have brutalized children. We know they kill black people as a matter of course, need to realize that there could be a day of reckoning. It is in the hands of the police to end this carnage. They can start doing acts that are public where they help citizens instead of assaulting, insulting, threatening, bullying, terrorizing, and giving vent to their hateful racist sentiments. There will come a day of reckoning and it's happening more and more now. They just got to, through burying two young officers in New York. There was a fellow being chased in Texas by the police. He hijacked a car. They came around a corner. He hit a wall, jumped out, started shooting, and injured three of them. And he must have been white because he continued, got away, barricaded in, in himself in a house for hours. They didn't throw in concussion grenades. They didn't set the house afire. They waited him out. And although they didn't have a close up, he came out with his hands up and you could see he was white. And you know why else I know he was white? Because they said the gun that he had was modified to fire like a machine gun or an automatic weapon. And the parts were from these 3D plans that you can get off the computer. But he tasted that police blood, smacked his lips and said, I might be the Dracula as far as police are concerned from now on. But to hurry right through, extra legal exonerations of cops, the bane of justice, the refusal to bring charges against cops who killed unarmed men, Eric Garner in New York, Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, 12-year-old Tamir Rice in Cleveland is highly reminiscent of the Jim Crow, quote, proceedings, unquote, in the South when Black people were lynched. The courts were extensions of the lynch mobs, either convicting innocent Black people or exonerating lynchers, bombers, burners, and shooters. Either prosecutors on their own or acting through grand juries, which they manipulate, engineer extra legal exoneration of killer cops. It has been said that a prosecutor can persuade a jury to convict a ham sandwich or release a John Dillinger, a Legs Diamond, a Machine Gun Kelly, Bonnie and Clyde. Anyway, continuing, lawless rogue cops are equipped with dangerous implements of physical force and dangerous mentalities to match. Prosecutors see no need for trials and therefore none will occur. Police brutality and rogue killings will always elude justice because of timid, co-opted prosecutors. Cops know this and increasingly exploit the fact the law and the cop protecting shadow of the law enforcement establishment will never visit justice upon police evil doers. Every now and then it happens when something is caught on camera and it is so blatant that they cannot get away with it. And when Ahmad Arbery was killed and the then prosecutor saw the film and knew it, she took no action against the cops. So there was a prosecutor who fits what I'm describing here. No system of justice can absorb extra legal exoneration of violent criminals in uniform without serious societal damage. Why not? Because criminality is infinitely more deadly when the law is being disregarded by those pretending to act on behalf of the law and justice. Those who carry or wear badges of authority of the state. A frantic crying need exists for less unpunished police violence and more accountability fostered by people such as yourself, Mr. Prosecutor, who are on oath to uphold the law. Then I mention all of the criminal statutes that were violated by these cops lying in an affidavit, not carrying out their duties, violating the law under color of law and so forth. I'm skipping a lot of this. 
rewarding bad behavior and coddling criminals in blue. In both cases where LPD internal affairs sustained charges of excessive force, which is a violation of criminal statutes, the miscreants are being well rewarded by escaping prosecution at your hands and obtaining employment with the Sheriff's Department and the State Patrol respectively. So rather than being brought to justice for their criminal behavior, both miscreants are rewarded and put into position to commit further depredations against citizens. Although I must admit that the State Patrol and the Sheriff surprised me by their complicity, your coddling of law enforcement criminals follows a pattern of ancient vintage in America, whereby prosecutors are so intertwined with cops and work so closely with them that such prosecutors apparently accept the notion that their hands are tied when confronted with law enforcement criminals, despite its being more morally, ethically, and legally reprehensible, it is no surprise that you and other prosecutors behave in this fashion. I guess you know a tree by the fruit it bears, huh? Cowardice toward the police is par for the course for prosecutors. I'm going to just take about five more minutes and I'm through. If you don't realize it, let me tell you something. Excusing, coddling, and even rewarding lawless rogue cops infuses an attitude of roguery slash lawlessness and above the law arrogance throughout the rank and file, thereby creating a culture of excessive force, which is ex in extreme instances, results in the unjustified killing of unarmed persons, as has been happening from Ferguson to New York, with stopovers in Cleveland, Milwaukee, Utah, California, and other locations where the bane manifests itself. It is not really too great a stretch to assert that a prosecutor who refuses to carry out his or her prosecutor to prosecutorial duty is as much a rogue, perhaps even a worse one due to the higher standard placed upon prosecutors as lawless rogue cops and may be viewed as an aider and a better of police lawlessness, unprincipled and vicious. I'm not gonna read all this. I'm gonna say a few more words. There were 48 other senators, not one twitched or made a statement. There's an attorney general on oath to see that the laws of the state are complied with, not a whisper. No minister spoke out, nobody. Had I not said something, nothing would have been said at all. So I can find articles galore where Senator Chambers spoke, Senator Chambers did this. I was the one who got on the books a law that made it a crime for law enforcement officers, prison personnel, and others who had custody over somebody to abuse sexually or otherwise those people. I was the one who got a law that said if a person spends time in jail awaiting trial because he or she cannot make bond, the time served will count as time against a sentence. Some people didn't know that that wasn't always the case. There are other things that I would do because it wasn't difficult for me to put myself in the place of somebody who is friendless, who has no voice, who is condemned without a hearing, who may not have even been on the scene when something happens, but he looks like somebody who may have been there and is arrested, or he's dressed like somebody who was there. Well, how was he dressed? Well, he had on a shirt, pants, and a pair of shoes. And for a black man, that's close enough a description to arrest any black person they feel like arresting. I came in contact with numbers of young black guys who, when they were stopped by the police, the police didn't ask for identification or anything right away. They said, when was the last time you were arrested? As if to say, 
if we were doing our job, you would have been arrested and you'd have a record by now. And these are not things that I'm making up. I was young, obviously, before I became old. In those streets, I saw a lot. I was a victim of more arrests. I say more arrests than Jesse James. If I had been convicted of the charges that they brought against me, I couldn't have gotten in the legislature. But these cops knew the charges wouldn't stick because they knew that I would stand up, but they wanted to inconvenience me, drive me to the station, have me sitting in a room waiting to be interrogated. And then when I eagerly was ready to go, they said, well, that's right, Mr. Chambers, the charges are not going to be filed. You're free to go. And at first, I didn't have a way back home. I didn't drive a car. And if I had a car, I wouldn't have had it there because I was taken downtown in the police car. So maybe at three or four in the morning, I'd make my way home. But I was never mugged. I was never shot, never shot at, because I was a part of the community. And when people would see me, they'd say, hey, Chaim, can I give you a ride? And I'd say, no, I'd like to walk. Walking's good for me. But then it reached the point where if somebody saw me put in a police car at a safe distance, they would follow because the practice was to let me go. And that person would then pick me up and bring me back. If a charge were brought, somebody even in the police station on occasion would call the guy, he was called the one-armed bandit, a black male bondsman, and he'd come down and bond me out. There are things that I can talk about and don't care who would object and say it's not so. I experienced it. I know what these cops will do to you. And I was not and am not a criminal. Your criminal president, Richard Nixon, said, the public is entitled to know whether or not their president is a crook. I am not a crook. And you know what he was, don't you? At any rate, this is one time I'm not going to go over time. I will say, as the canary said, when he found out that the door to the cage was open, I'm out of here. Thank you for watching the Ernie Chambers Show. If you'd like to make suggestions, email us at ewcfacts at gmail.com. That's ewcfacts at gmail.com. This has been an EWC Communication production.